Greetings all, see the amateur historian in Southeast Portland. And I'm right at this turn here. This is a turn where Division Street, which is a fairly prominent uh, street running through Southeast Portland, begins to wrap around after it crosses under this, uh, there's uh, the tracks to lead to bridge over the river and then there's McLaughlin and Grand. And as the road wraps around and gets up to about where I'm standing right now. And as this turn wraps around and begins to go this direction, pretty much once it turns and starts going north, this is where Division Street becomes 3rd Avenue. And pretty much where I'm standing, you wouldn't know it looking either direction, but this is where Harrison Street would have gone through. This is, this is Harrison Street. <laughs> and you know, it's crazy. Like based on just the existence of today's story, I know that at some point Harrison did actually go through here across where division becomes third. So it's just so wild. Now granted this story happened 115 years ago, but still, it's because it, a lot of the streets up here, even with the onset of new buildings and stuff, pretty much every street going north that crosses 3rd is still there, at least to some degree or another. The next street up is Stevens Street, like me, and it goes like not even a full block this way and that way, but at least there's still remnants of it. Whereas Harrison Street, Google Maps implies there's like a little loop around here, but the only loop around I'm seeing is literally like a stair, there's like a stairway over here that wraps up and I think it comes back out over here. So I don't think it's an actual street. Anyway, this is the prime setting for a fresh episode of Historic Murders of Portland. So it's the morning of November 12th, 1906. A man by the name of Orlando S. Murray has come to this area, which isn't that, you know, hard to do because he lived literally like right over here. And he came to this location, again, that once would have been Harrison Street crossing third as it becomes division. And at the northwest corner of that intersection, which would literally be right here, this equality sign is just ripping right through the, the general, probably the you know front yard of the house that would have been here. This was the home of a Mrs. Frank Porter, who was the sister of a man, a 21-year-old guy named Lincoln Whitney. And it's interesting, as a brief side note, uh, this is 1906. I noticed I stumbled onto a murder case from 1910. And in that case, a man named Frank Porter was murdered. So I wonder if this area, if, if the sister was named Mrs. Frank Porter, I wonder if the, that was the same Frank Porter that was murdered just like four years later. The sounds of industry and I think a motorcycle. Now this story, this story got me bumping. This story got me hopping in my shoes initially because the reason given for why Orlando Murray went to this location to see specifically Lincoln Whitney was in relation to his sister. And it's about 7 a.m. It's November, it's probably pretty cold. Murray bundles up and, and wanders over here and he's gonna try to talk some last second sense into Mr. Whitney. And the way the papers had it was Murray went over there. He was defending the honor of his family. He was defending the honor of his sister. He was protecting his sister. This was a true noble man who believed family first 
And it was just the way it was initially written about in the papers, and trust me, I'm going to get to the actual events itself, but the way that they discussed this in the aftermath was like, Orlando Murray was a hero. He was not just a Portland hero, he was an American hero. And some people are staring at me. I think when I point it aggressively, people think I'm just losing my mind. So I came into this case excited, like, oh man, this, this is gonna be one of those cases where like someone did something so horrible and then their brother came in and took care of the situation. And it'd be just one of these, it'd be one of these few times where someone gets murdered and you're almost kind of like, hell yeah, brother. <laughs> but then as I went through all the information of the case, by the time I got to the end, I suddenly found myself not knowing what to think. I was a little bit confused about where I stood on it. it it's truly interesting. By the time I was done, I wasn't really so certain how much of a hero you could say Orlando Murray was, or really how bad of a guy for certain you could say that Lincoln Whitney was. So it was one of these stories that turned me, turned me, around in circles until by the time I was done, I was just lost in a daze. So why was Orlando Murray here on November 12th, 1906 to visit Lincoln Whitney specifically? Well, about two years earlier, Whitney had met Orlando's uh, slightly younger sister, Mary. Mary Murray while she was picking hops. I know these aren't hops, but they're real pretty and they make for some good visuals until you get to this. Um, so he met her while they were picking hops and the details are a little scatterbrained in terms of exactly what happened after that, but it appears some form of a physical exchange was had between the two. Whatever the exact circumstances and whenever exactly this happened, it seems a short while after these two met. At least that's how it's implied. And I don't know because if you imply that this happened two years ago, why did it take so long for action to really start being taken? So maybe it happened a little bit closer to November 12th, 1906 than one might guess because I don't know exactly when this happened. But this was the instigation for why Orlando Murray was here that day, was at some point along the line, as they put it in the paper, Mr. Whitney ruined his sister. The implications are clear. They had intercourse out of wedlock and it's 1906. And if you're a woman that has sex before marriage or outside of marriage, you are ruined for life. Tragic, that was, you know, very much the attitude back then. So, I don't know the circumstances surrounding that. I don't know if Mary was willingly, um, you know, that she willingly did this or if it was more Whitney, excuse me, Whitney more pressured her into doing this. None of those details are really given. All we know is that they engaged in a manner of love that you dare not speak its name. And Mary is just ruined by this. She comes home, she's crying, she's hysterical. She's like, I'm gonna marry him, I have to marry him. You have to let me marry him. It's the only way to salvage like my life. Really tragic, you know, that this is the way people thought back then that, you know, you had sex with one random guy and you just were ruined for life. But that's how the attitude was. And so her family wanted to rectify this situation. They wanted to, they wanted the two to marry, to salvage, not just Mary's reputation, but to, you know, salvage Mary's sanity. Really, when you get down to it, she was so shattered by this experience. And apparently he agreed, you know, when the family started contacting him and being like, something needs to be done about this, you know, what you two engaged in. And he apparently initially was really responsible. Now this is according to Orlando Murray's side of the story, but, Apparently, uh, Lincoln Whitney said, yeah, I'll come up and visit you guys. He lived down in Hubbard, which is near Salem. It's, you know, 40 some miles, probably off this way a little bit. 
So he said he'd make a trip up to Portland and he would set things right. That's how he put it. Now again, Whitney's sister lived right here and Orlando Murray's family lived like just a block or two over here. So interestingly enough that the, the main culprit lived so far away, but his sister lived almost right across the street from um, the Murray family. And yet they didn't meet by that chance. It was randomly picking hops. I don't know, maybe the hops were, maybe this was hops at one time. I don't know where the hop picking actually occurred. And it's interesting. I have to interject this as a little side note. Uh, because those of you who know, you know I'm I'm very, I'm almost obsessed with the 1921 murder that happened, the murder of a guy named Harry Aji, who may or may not have been killed by his wife. I did a whole three hour and 15 minute audio book on it. That was the audio book I did when I hit 2000 subs. And they lived on Druid Avenue in the Portsmouth neighborhood, which is way, way off this way up in North Portland. Well, it just so happened Orlando Murray, because I think like his mom and him and his uh, sister lived down here. His dad lived on Druid Avenue. Orlando Murray's dad, Orlando Murray Sr., as it turned out to be, he lived right across the street from the Aji home. So I was like, what are the odds? Especially back then when there was a lot fewer people living here. So I just, I had to interject that. Uh, but anyway, so... Whitney keeps his promise, comes back to town, but is immediately, he completely does a 180. He's utterly resistant to getting married to, um, married to Mary. Um, I don't know if it's because he did, didn't really like her that much. He just wanted her for sex or if he just didn't want to get married in general. And he pretty much laughed in their face and was like, ha ha, yeah, good luck forcing me to do that, you know? She's the woman in this case, so she's the one whose reputation is going to be ruined. Because again, that's how a lot of people thought. And on a side note, the, the inferences were made, of course, entirely from Whitney's side of the family, that Mary, you know, they wouldn't say it, in, they wouldn't say it specifically, but they used roundabout language by saying, oh, she didn't have a good reputation. They were implying that she was a whore that whored around. Um, so that, you know... Really, this was Mary's fault and that she had manipulated just another guy into having sex with her. And now she, now all of a sudden she's ashamed when she'd been fooling around with all these people. And I never found any verification um, for either side in these news. It was more just inferred. You know, Whitney's side of the family said, well, she's a whore and she used him. And now she wants to get married because she's caught and people know that she slept with him out of wedlock. So now all of a sudden that story can get around and she's gonna be ashamed of it, so now she all of a sudden has to marry the guy. So you see, lots of little details like that. I couldn't find verification one way or another which side was right. But, you know, as you go through Orlando Murray's depiction of events, you know, Whitney's side of the family treated them horribly and didn't take it seriously. So Orlando Murray is pissed. And he actually goes to see the district attorney across the river here to ask him if there's any way, some way that he can get like charges brought up against um, Lincoln Whitney for what he had done to his sister, for defiling his sister. But apparently this sex occurred down in Hubbard where Whitney primarily lived. So the DA here said, well, that's a crime. That's a Marion County crime. That's not a Multnomah County crime here where Portland is. You gotta go down to Salem. So he goes down to Salem, talks to the district attorney there, and he pretty much says the same thing. He's like, there's nothing I can do about it. So it's early November and Orlando Murray is even more frustrated. He's even more angry. He wants justice for his sister, you know, regardless of the possibility that maybe she pressured, you know, this guy to doing it or the other way around. He wants to salvage what's left of his sister's reputation and the legal system has decided screw you we're not helping you so lincoln decides um sorry so orlando decides take one last one last effort he's gonna go see lincoln whitney and initially i thought it was more like he was gonna try to convince lincoln to admit that he'd you know defiled this woman out of wedlock 
but really he was trying to his objective was he wanted to convince Whitney to finally just marry his sister and he even went so far one of the newspaper articles I saw uh, Orlando it was just that he wanted the sister married to get rid of that stigma of just being you know a single young woman who had you know slept around at least on this one occasion he even told Whitney like if you get married with her to her and then in the immediate aftermath decide you don't want to be together you don't want to live with her and you just go your way and she goes hers I'm fine with that just get married these are the things he's saying to them to Whitney on November 12th 1906 here at the home of Mrs. Frank Porter He's just trying to pull every, you know, every little trick out of his out of his bag to get this guy to finally do it. And Whitney finally stands up after about 45 minutes of this back and forth verbiage. And even Whitney's own family members, because his mom is there, he has, I think, two sisters there, and they're all trying to convince him to just do it at this point. Even his own family is telling him, just marry the girl. And he wouldn't do it. And after about 45 minutes, of, of jabbering, it's almost 8 a.m. Whitney finally says, no, I'm, I'm flat out not doing it. I'm out of here. And he stands up and proceeds to start leaving. And with the address being um, a Harrison Street address, but being at this corner, that means that the front door would have been facing this direction. So kind of right over this fence here would have been, you know, this would have been the front yard. And Lincoln Whitney would have been walking through the house and he would have been walking probably, you know, the front porch is probably where this slab of concrete is now. And as he's walking, either this was his plan all along, like if this guy, I'm giving him one last chance and if he says no, I'm gonna take drastic action. So whether it was that or whether it was just a sudden angry impulse, just so sick of what his sister had gone through, Orlando Murray pulls a revolver suddenly and he goes to shoot Whitney as he's trying, as he's starting to walk away. And I don't even know if Whitney realizes he has a gun pulled. Whitney's mother steps in between Murray and Whitney. So he almost, if he would open fire, he probably would have shot Whitney's mother. Um, and so a little scuffle ensues, and of course, <laughs> Whitney looks back and sees, oh man, Murray's got a gun, he's probably gonna try to kill me now. And he starts to run, and you know, Orlando Murray knows he has only one chance, so he reaches around the mother and fires one shot and hits him in the head. Drops Whitney flat on the porch at the front of the house, which again would be kind of generally where this concrete slab is, theoretically. He's dazed, he's probably gonna die because he's been shot in the head, but he's dazed. He kind of, you know, stumbles back to his feet and Murray sees that he's still up. So he fires another shot that goes right through his chest. And that final shot drops Lincoln Whitney dead right over here. And, you know, they, they, they tried to say later that it was, you know, Orlando Murray did bring a gun there, but a lot of people carry guns then, and maybe, you know, if he did pull the gun, he was just gonna menace him, like, you marry my sister, man. Um, but it was pretty much implied real quickly that no nobody really seemed to believe that Orlando Murray had full intent, premeditation to kill Whitney here. Otherwise, why would he have sat there with him for so long trying to talk him into it? But I think he probably had premeditation, like, if he doesn't agree to do it, I'm going to kill him. And Orlando Murray's actions afterwards, I feel, also imply that before he got to the home here, I think he knew there was the possibility he was going to end up killing Lincoln Whitney. And that at least suggests... Maybe that doesn't suggest premeditation, but it suggests an essence, at least, of it. But the moment he shoots Whitney dead, he sprints out of the house. And what he's doing is he's trying to get across the river to immediately turn himself in. He's taking full responsibility. He, he apparently wasn't even nervous when he got to the courthouse. He just walked in and he's like, I've killed a man. Pulled the revolver out of his pocket, put it on the counter. I was like, and that's what I killed him with. But there's this moment 
there's this freaking moment and it's it's something out of a movie because remember orlando murray's family only lives like it says they lived near grand avenue which is like two blocks over and and obviously you know there's a lot of industrial stuff here but these buildings weren't here in 1906 and there's this moment you know when like two eyes meet and you don't have to say anything, but both sides know exactly what's happened. And it's sad and it's tragic, but you know in your own heart that a, a sacrifice was made. So from the location of the um, Frank Porter home back here, Orlando Murray just starts sprinting, starts sprinting up 3rd Avenue. And as he's running, again, a bunch of these buildings here were not here to obstruct a view. He looks down this way. And this crossing here, this is where McLaughlin and Grand Avenue meet, so it was right here. Orlando uh, Murray is running up the street and he turns and flashes a glance this way and catches sight of his mother standing in front of their own home. And they briefly, you know, as he's running, he looks over and they make eye contact. And Orlando Murray just nods like, it's okay, mom, I took care of it. And then he just continues to run up Third Avenue. And so he just runs, runs, runs. He runs several blocks till he gets to Third and Hawthorne. And then he hops on the Mount Tabor streetcar that crossed the Hawthorne Bridge into downtown. Now, of course, that would be a little bit difficult to do nowadays, not just because we don't have a streetcar, but because, well, this is Hawthorne. I mean, technically, this is Hawthorne down here, too. This is where Hawthorne would have been when he, uh, Murray hopped on the streetcar and then went this way and crossed the Hawthorne Bridge. But today, you cross the Hawthorne Bridge up here. So, you know, another another example of how drastically things can change in you know 115 years. That this is this is the sun would be hitting me right now, um, 115 years ago. But anyway, so Murray, you know, darted probably I don't know it's about six blocks this way, hopped on the streetcar line and went boom right across the river to turn himself in. And, you know, it was just, it was an insane case. It was totally setting itself up to be a, another case that fell under the guise of what we called, you know, murders as a result of the, um, the unwritten law, which of course I've referenced so many times on my channel, especially in my This Day in History videos as of late. And even within a day, within a day of the murders happening, there was already reports kind of going through uh, the newspaper and you know whatever other media channels there may have been, not a lot, that this, this case was destined to be an unwritten law case wherein Orlando Murray would get off for what he did because he was doing it um, in honor and protection of his family. Now, oftentimes the unwritten law more applied to uh, a husband or wife, usually a husband, who, you know, found out their significant other was fooling around and they came in and shot the, the, the lover in that dynamic dead. That was the more common form in which the unwritten law was recognized. This wasn't quite the same in that, it, but it was still, it was still someone trying to do the best for their family. But the issue was, was Lincoln Whitney really as bad as he was implying. Now, of course, Whitney's own relatives said not. His own brother said like, no. <laughs> and he was another guy that said, trust me, Mary Murray uh, did not have a good reputation. Uh, she was hardly the first person, um, or, or his brother was hardly the first person that she had slept with. And he, and of, but of course, he, he say this, you know, this is one of those things where it's like, well, now I don't really trust you because I feel like you're just blinded by family loyalty. His, um, Whitney's brother, G.W. Whitney, 
then says like, you know, whenever, whenever my brother wrong, did any kind of wrong, he always wanted to, to fix it. He wanted to make amends for what he'd done. And the fact that he didn't make amends here for what had happened tells me that he didn't do anything wrong. And I'm like, oh, if it was only that simple. But still, there was some questions like, you know, you pretty much had the Murray's side of the story and the Whitney's side of the story. And they both were saying drastically different things. And if Whitney's side of the family was in fact being more honest, which we couldn't know for certain, well then, Orlando Murray doesn't really have any justification at all, even in an unwritten law context, to just show up, pressure this guy, and when he didn't get the answers he wanted, kill him. So, so it was a very complicated matter. And it's, it's very interesting because in the end, I think there was just enough conflict there that Orlando Murray did end up going on trial. He wasn't just like let go, he wasn't dismissed by a grand jury, he was actually forced to go on trial in this matter, uh, which didn't really mean a whole lot. He, you know, went on and he was acquitted inside of 30 minutes. So, uh, you know, the unwritten law had done its thing. And even though he went on trial, you know, he was let off relatively quick. But here's the interesting thing is that there was a lot of backlash for this decision. And again, Orlando Murray's situation is a little bit different than like a husband coming home, finding his wife with her lover and then shooting him dead. It's a, it's a different set of circumstances, but still it's so interesting to think. Uh, a little less than a year after this, it's a story I've referenced a few times. I did a Historic Murders of Portland episode on it, but it's, it's just so interesting the way, the, the, the like differences between these, these two events. This guy, Charles Reynolds, who lived, I think on 14th, like just the other side of downtown. He finds out that his wife has been fooling around with this guy named George Hibbins from Walla Walla, Washington. And so he decides to take action. He thinks that like his wife has stopped seeing him, but then his wife calls him while he's at work at the Imperial Hotel over here. And he hears Hibbins voice in the background and he knows that Hibbins has come back. So he leaves work, goes straight home, goes into his house, goes into his bedroom where his wife Lulu and George Hibbins are, pulls out his gun, opens fire, shoots Hib um, Hibbins like five times. It's obvious what he came there to do. And then Hibbins stumbles out of the house all bloody and dies in front of the hotel he's staying at. The Lincoln, by the way, at I believe 11th and Madison. Anyway, if you ever want to visit. So that case happened, and mind you, this is like a little over, this is a little less than a year later, he is acquitted in like record time, and he gets a standing ovation. The jury got a standing ovation for letting him off. It was so just. And here we are a little earlier than that, and Orlando Murray gets off pretty much under guise of the unwritten rule, and there's all this like criticism and black backlash saying like, well, what is this telling? society and there was like a written piece I found that essentially said like you know this situation utilizing the unwritten law to free Orlando Murray um, you know hopefully this will convince uh, young men who want to manipulate and force women into relations with them hopefully it'll make them think twice but beyond that was it going to convince young women that they could kind of go out and make foolish mistakes and in the end it would be okay because they would always have a father or a brother around waiting to go out and shoot someone who had wronged them like what kind of precedent was this setting and of course this is 1906 and there's this attitude that women are just erratic and flippant and don't know how to conduct themselves so you know yeah. Women are just falling into the arms of men all the time because they're so easily manipulated and they need a man to come back around and, you know, cap a guy when he's doing wrong. And it was just, I mean, I understand it to a degree, but I could kind of see where a lot of this was kind of just getting back at the crux of women don't know how to conduct themselves. 
it's a man's job to make sure everything's all right. And this is saying that it's okay for men to start shooting other men who manipulate. Where, where do the parents' responsibility come in through all this and just all of this? All of this hoopla that didn't happen, you know, in, in instances like with Charles Reynolds killing George Hibbins. So it's, it's an interesting twist um, in terms of how the public kind of perceived what had happened. And another you know, kind of uh, serious criticism that was being put out there was what about Mary Murray? <clears throat> what about Orlando Murray's sister? Who, you know, marrying this guy was like the last way to kind of like save her, at least in the eyes of society at that time. And, you know, certainly Lincoln Whitney was going to, you know, any lengths possible to be like, no, no, I'm not marrying her. Like, get out of my house. Or I guess get out of my sister's house. And so it didn't seem like he was ever going to give, but there was also this attitude that in snapping, you know, reaching that last straw kind of moment when Orlando Murray chose to sh shoot him, he forever ruined any chance that that man would marry his sister and possibly, you know, improve her reputation, make her feel better about herself. He permanently removed any chance of that ever happening. So the attitude was like, okay, he killed this guy in, in, you know, in his sister's honor, but he also ruined the very thing that was supposed to restore, at least in the eyes of his family and society at the time, that was the one thing that was supposed to restore her honor, was to marry this guy. Um, and of course, you know, I went in thinking Lincoln Whitney was gonna be a real piece of crap, and now I'm like, I don't know for certain. Because it's, you know, what one family says against what the other family says. And somehow before this video is done, I'm walking under the overpass from Hawthorne Bridge again, except I'm just on the west side of the river now. Oh, birds are coming. So, so it was kind of a complex situation where in the end, I kind of, I kind of still stand here, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know. My face is getting very, my face is getting a little crazy as I'm stepping back out of that sun. I just don't know where to stand on it because there are certain details that are unknown that really make it kind of impossible to say for certain. Exact. I mean, it seems pretty guaranteed that there was intercourse outside of wedlock between these two young people, but who instigated it? Who? You know, all these questions. You know, was what one side of the family was saying more right than the other? A lot of questions that just can't fully be answered, mostly because I couldn't find that information anywhere. So it's like, in the end, I'm like, did Orlando Murray do the right thing? Even in the eyes of the time? Was he really protecting his sister's honor, whether he thought he was or not? I don't know. I don't know if I fully by that. I can understand wholeheartedly his situation and what drove him to do that in the end. I just don't know if he really should have been let off by the unwritten law. And I really don't understand why people were so quick to say that there was no premeditation at all in this case. When he brought a gun, he, um, you know, he shoots the guy the moment he finally just says no for the last time. He immediately runs to the courthouse here in downtown and says, I shot the man. Like he just had fully been prepared for that moment to come. I think there was, I think he knew wholeheartedly when he showed up, if this guy wasn't gonna do what he asked, he was gonna shoot him. And that is premeditation to at least some level. And perhaps one of the most unfortunate things about this whole thing was about four days, uh, this is mid-November 1906, about four days after the acquittal of Orlando Murray, Lincoln Whitney's father, Robert Whitney, who lived down in Hubbard, he apparently went into a state of shock after hearing about the acquittal and went into a state that he never recovered from and he actually died as a result of that shock. And it's interesting because you hear about that happening a lot more back then. And of course, people's medical health was completely different. There was a lot of differences, but that was a lot more common back then that people would just die from these random moments of shock. And so that's kind of the last little tragedy on top of all this is a son gets murdered and then his father ends up dying, you know, about a month and a half later. But that unfortunately, that's pretty much 
where it ended. You know, Orlando Murray got away with what he did. Um, and should he have? Shouldn't he have? I really, ah. I'm kind of leaning towards no. You know, obviously he shouldn't have murdered the guy, but I'm tr again, I'm trying to look at it under the lens of 1906 and how people thought. And even then, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know if he should have gotten away with it. So there's, there's a little... Oh no, I'm filming myself. You're all good. <laughs> oh no, thank you. <laughs> you too. Uh, anyway, where were we at? Guy was just making sure he wasn't messing with my picture. I'm like, nah, I'm good. So um, anyway, that's, uh, I mean, that's really the end of the story. That's the story of Lincoln Whitney murdered by Orlando Murray perceivably in defense of his sister and her honor. So thank you so much. God, this waterfront concrete is burning me. Ah. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone who stopped by, supporting my channel, supporting the series, supporting me, and all that other stuff. And uh, as always, before I go, remember to like, share, subscribe, hit up my Patreon, all these little ways you can help my little channel grow just a little bit more. The link to my Patreon is in the uh, description of this video, and I'm trying to post there multiple times a week. A lot of extra content you can only get if you join there now. The link to that is in the description below, as well as the links to my Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, and my Reddit subreddit, and my TikTok. And all that said, from Waterfront, downtown Portland, it's been Steve the Amateur Historian with another episode of Historic Murders of Portland.